Yeah, many thoughts in one idea. That's always good with the jacket. That's always good, yes. Um, so, of course, we're in the Alan Turing building. Jack is a Turing fellow here in Manchester. And of course, as none of you know, he just received the Turing Award. Is a, an amazing achievement. Mm. Well done. <laughs> Well, thank you. Um, so I want I'd like to talk about, um, uh, well, first let me say happy birthday, Nick. Uh, I'd like to talk about some software we're developing. Um, but I, I wanna say that my titles changed. I recently became an emeritus professor. So I became emeritus on Friday. Last Friday, I became emeritus. So I retired. <laughs> I retired from the University of Tennessee and um, uh, my wife heard retire retirement and she was wondering what that what that means. I told her, well, I'm emeritus. So uh, the university is gonna hire me back. So they hire me back two days a week at the university. I still have my appointment at Oak Ridge and I still have my appointment here in Manchester. So not much has changed. <laughs> so my wife uh, is a little confused at the risk of embarrassing Francois. Uh, so Francois and I um, met at a meeting in, in workshop in Lille uh, back in 1980, 86. And uh, I heard her give a talk and um, I asked if she would be interested in coming to work at Tennessee as a postdoc. And she, uh, she agreed. So she spent a year with us in, in Tennessee. And during that year, we've had visitors uh, from around the world and, and Nick, Nick kept on showing up as a, as a visitor at that point. And I was happy to have Nick uh, come by and, and visit. Uh, and then, you know, I, I'm a little slow on these things. And eventually, um, uh, you know, I realized that, um, uh, you know, there was something more going on and, uh, and, they, and they got married, I guess, in 1998, 1998. So they, the postdoc in 97 got married in 1998. So, uh, you know, Nick uh, brings a number of things to, to our field. He brings reliability, efficiency, and rigor to computing. He, uh, he helps in developing new algorithm fundamentals uh, uh, to many applications, adapting existing algorithms and expanding the capabilities. He plays a leading role in presenting and uh, interpreting theory and practical mathematical advances. And you know, he's more than a theorist. He's a, he's a practitioner and, and puts that to use in terms of saving time, memory, data motion, and all the other things that go into making uh, high performance uh, computing a reality. And in addition to that, he serves as an extraordinary, he has, has served extraordinarily through his role in organizing meetings, being editor, of journals and encyclopedias, and of course, president of Siam. So we thank him for that. Thank you very much, Nick, and happy birthday uh, for that. So I'd just like to talk about uh, some of the work that I've been involved in over the past. Uh, this is the first 30 years of my life, basically, is on this slide. Um, you know, I worked on, uh, we, we, we originally took, you know, the algorithms from uh, Wilkinson and Reinch and put them into use in a package called IcePAC. Uh, it goes by, um, uh, uh, it was involved in a project called NATS, National Activity for Testing Software. There were a number of uh, groups and efforts involved in that. The idea was to take the uh, ALGOL uh, procedures and turn them into Fortran. And we did this very faithfully in terms of the translation process, taking ALGOL routines and translating them into Fortran. ALGOL stores things by rows, the, the arrays. Fortran stores things by columns. We were faithful to ALGOL, so we stored things by rows. And that led to very inefficient uh, software in the end. So that was the, the ice pack thing. Um, scalar architectures were the big deal then. And um, along came a, a standard, the level one BLAS. So um, uh, Lawson, Hansen, Kincaid, and Crow created those. I implemented a version of those BLAS in Fortran using techniques to improve uh, the performance for those vector operations, unrolling loops. And uh, that led to uh, the implementation that was put into the Tom's algorithm. In the 1980s, we created a package called LINPAC for solving systems of linear equations that were based on those uh, Blas routines um, and uh, column orientation. We thought that was hot stuff and um, it, it came out. So vector architectures, we had vector, uh, vector operations going on. We thought it was a perfect match. Only later did we realize that that wasn't quite the right way to get performance. We needed, a, we needed a level of expression higher than vector operations. So along with a group of people, including uh, Sven Hammerling, we created something called the level two and the level three BLAS. The architectures at the time were multiprocessor and cache-based systems. That cache was important for performance. The higher level BLAS were, could um, uh, keep uh, data in cache and get uh, very effective uh, use of that. 
and we decided to take the package Lin Pack and Ice Pack and create something new called LA Pack. And Bai was involved in the creation of that along with a number of other people, Jim Demmel. And we created a package which basically took the eigenvalue and the linear systems of equations into, into LA Pack. LA Pack, um, again, is, uh, is used for this blocking and cache friendly uh, kind of architectures. But on the horizon was distributed memory architectures for scientific computing. And this set of code was good for shared memory machines where we have a small number of processors. We had to adjust our focus on distributed memory. So we worked on, in the mountains of Tennessee, we worked on a package called uh, PVM. Um, that, that had a certain amount of traction in the community, but what was really needed was a de facto standard similar to the BLAS for doing message passing. So we created something called MPI that uh, defined what it meant to pass messages on a computer for scientific computations, and that, that became the de facto standard. And in the uh, early 2000s, uh, we created a package called Scalapack, and Bai and, and Sven were involved in the creation of those packages using MPI as the basis for message passing for distributed architectures. So Scalapack was intended to be a replacement for LAPack on the modern architectures of the time. So the time was roughly at the turn of the century. Since then, um, high performance computing is constantly changing. So the changes today that we have are machines that are uh, highly parallel. They have distributed memory. They use MPI, they use OpenMP, MPI for message passing, OpenMP for parallelism uh, with, uh, within a node itself. Today's machines are just incredible. So this is the fastest machine today. It's a machine at Oak Ridge National Lab. It goes by the name of Frontier. It runs at two exaflops. So that's a theoretical peak performance, two times 10 to the 18 operations per second. I gave a talk, I, I gave an interview in France a, a few weeks ago, and I said, um, this machine is a billion, billion operations per second. And when that appeared in the paper, it, it read two billion operations per second. <laughs> and it's a billion, billion, you get that right. It's a billion, billion. So this is a fast machine. Uh, you know, that's an incredible number, billion, you know, 10 to the 18 per second. Um, uh, so this machine is based on AMD parts, uh, AMD CPU, and has four of these uh, GPUs. Uh, most of the performance comes from the GPU. So you had better be using the GPU on this machine, otherwise you might as well go home. So just to give that context, 98% uh, of the performance of this machine comes from using the GPUs. So if you don't use the GPUs, you're only gonna get two, the theoretical peak is only gonna be 2%. So again, if you're not using GPUs, go home. Um, today we have, you know, this machine here has um, 8 million, 8 million cores, 8 million processes is the way to think of that. You have to coordinate that. So your, your application, your, whatever your software you're developing for this machine, if you're gonna run at scale, that's what you gotta coordinate. So simple loop level parallelism, the kind that I grew up on, you can't do that. The fork join kind of parallelism, you know, that would cripple uh, 8 million things. You know, one thread of execution forking off into 8 million and then waiting for things to collapse into one, I can't do that. So you have to think about new ways of expressing parallelism and the new, the, the, the ways, the new ways, this is not a new way, the, the way that we're expressing parallelism today within the packages is to use a directed acyclic graph express the algorithm in terms of a DAG, and then try to understand what the critical path in the DAG is, and that will expose the most parallelism that you have in that, and that'll be able to beat any kind of simple loop level parallelism. Communication's really expensive. Floating point is free. The machines are over provisioned for floating point. You really need to optimize your communication if you wanna get good performance. And I'll show you an example of what I mean by that. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, our standard, our conventional wisdom is we count operations. And if my algorithm and your algorithm have a different operation count, we would think that the one with less operations would be faster. Well, that's not true today. That's, that's out the window. And that's not true because of communication. Communication isn't taken into account when you look at just the op count. So you really need to take a package and look at what it's doing inside to get, to get a feeling for which is, which is better. And as, as we've heard uh, uh, yesterday, you know, today the floating point, floating point operations are, uh, that, that we can use uh, come in different flavors. You can use um, quad precision, you could use double precision, you could use um, 
uh, single precision, you could use half precision, and now there's even qu uh, quarter precision. And you, know, you get basically a doubling with each of those levels as you go. And if you can get by with less precision, you can make your algorithms run faster. And then we have techniques which allow us to do uh, things to improve the accuracy of those lower precision results. So we've, we've been designing some packages, what I'll call experimental things, to try to test the, uh, our understanding of the hardware. So we had a package called Magma, which looked at uh, multi-core in, uh, in terms of how we can do that. And that was solving systems of equations using multi-core uh, 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 architectures. And a package called Magma. Magma was targeted at GPUs. So how far could we push the linear algebra into the GPUs to get performance? And that's what it was trying to do. Uh, we have a package called Parsec. Parsec is trying to be the, the task scheduler. I, remember, I mentioned this directed acyclic graph. This is a mechanism for executing that uh, DAG on the, on the hardware itself. And the other thing we're, we've uh, looked at is this thing we, we call uh, the batch blahs. Uh, Rob gave his talk yesterday and uh, batch blahs is, uh, you have an operation like a multi matrix multiply, only you have a million of them at the same time, independent ones, and you wanna run that with one call. So you have a, you batch up an operation like that, you make one call, and it's handled underneath the covers using the hardware as best it can, scheduling those things on the underlying hardware. So scheduling it on the GPU, let's say, or multiple GPUs. And not, don't ju just think of matrix multiply, but think of linear algebra operations. I got 100,000 SVDs I wanna do. We're gonna batch them together and ship them off. They could be different sizes and that's handled by the mechanisms underneath. So one call, multiple things going on, embarrassingly parallel. That's the context for uh, batched flaws. And we need that uh, going forward. Today, we're working on a package called Slate. So Slate is the, trying to take the essence of this stuff and putting it into the context of the architectures that we have today. So use state-of-the-art algorithms, try new ideas out, target for uh, multi-core and GPUs, put out software that's portable, and has all of these features, accuracy, community, involvement, innovation, performance, portability, productivity, readability, and reliability. That's the goal of these packages is to embrace those concepts and make that uh, going forward. So how do we fund this? How do we get this off the ground? Well, DOE has this wonderful project called the Exascale Computing Program. So the Exascale Computing, Computing Program is a seven year program they have $4 billion, which they are investing in exascale computing, Department of Energy, seven years, 1.8 billion effort um, uh, got things started. The idea here is to, is to buy three exascale computers, billion, billion operations per second, three of them. And uh, those computers cost 1.8 billion. That's the total cost for three computers. So think 600 million per computer, plus they're gonna give computer vendors, $400 million. The $400 million is, is to go into non-reoccurring engineering. So you have to understand these computers are composed of commodity parts, commodity processors, commodity interconnect, but we wanna tweak them. That is to say, we wanna make changes to the architecture so that they can work on scientific problems better. So we, it, we give a, an incentive to the vendors to make changes, $400 million was the incentive. That's given to companies like AMD and uh, Intel and some of the, some of the uh, network companies like Cray who provides the interconnect. So they tweak those things to help scientific computing. So hopefully the chips they have will, will effectively do that. So there's six national labs that are involved in this, the, the standard ones. The Department of Energy has two kinds of labs, ones that are related to open science and ones that are related to defense technology, weapons labs. So the six labs are um, Argonne, uh, Berkeley, and Oak Ridge. Those are open science labs. Lawrence Livermore, Sandy, and Los Alamos, those are weapons labs. And they're all involved in this project. They all have the need for high-performance computing. So there's three, uh, there's three technical areas here that are involved, hardware integration, software technologies, and applications. Applications, of course, are the focus of the, of the $4 billion. This is all about the applications. The hardware is incidental. So this is not about the technology. It's not about driving the technology, it's about driving the applications forward. And we have um, 84 research teams in place doing this work. So the split of money is um, 
um, half of the money goes into, into hardware, and the other half goes into applications and software. So that's sort of the, the rough breakdown. So what do you get for that? This explains that, uh, as I've said, three computers, 600 million, and then 400 million for this non-reoccurring engineering. So those are the three machines. This one's in place today. Uh, the other machines are a uh, machine going into Argonne National Lab called Aurora. That's gonna be based on Intel parts, ours is AMD. And then there's a machine going into Livermore called El Capitan. And that's gonna be similar, although not exactly the same as Frontier. It's gonna use AMD parts. So those are the three pieces of the hardware. There are 21 applications which are targeted. So these are applications which are energy related. This is the Department of Energy. So they're based on energy things. You probably can't read that, but you know, they, they involve uh, wind energy, nuclear energy, fossil energy, combustion, um, you know, and so on and so forth down the line, even cancer research. And um, what else is unusual here? Astrophysics and uh, additive manufacturing. All of those things are included under the umbrella. Those are the applications which are the main focus of all of this, uh, this work. And there's also a bunch of software that's being created, targeted at this stuff here. So there's 84 software projects involved. This is a big project. And uh, I'm delighted to be involved in this. So at the University of Tennessee, we are involved in, in six of those software efforts, designing software for the Exascale uh, program. And Slate is one of those, uh, Slate is one of those things that, that's in there. So Slate, again, is trying to um, put in place some linear algebra software Dense matrices, don't think sparse uh, iterative solvers. That's not our job. Somebody else's job is, is doing that. That's an important part, but we're doing the dense stuff. So uh, trying to put in place the solvers, least squares problems, eigenvalue and SVD. Re modern replacement for scale pack is what you should have in mind. Everything's being written uh, using MPI and OpenMP. Uh, it's being uh, C++ is the language that we're using. There's backward compatibility. So if you did have a call to LAPAC, you can put, leave that LAPAC call in. Underneath, you can be using Slate library. So there's, a, there's an interface that goes in that direction to allow you to call the, the underlying Slate routine so you get the benefits of this stuff. GPU support is there for all of the, um, all of the GPUs that we have available to us. So software stack looks something like this. Uh, what can I say? So these are, these are underlying routines that come from the vendors. There's the BLAS++ and LAPAC++. MPI and OpenMP are the models there. There's some uh, things that help. Slate is gonna be built on that. And these are the applications that need the software. This is a project that if you're developing software, it has to be used by the applications. If it's not used by the applications, you're not gonna get funding. So that's sort of the message going into this project. So we have to bind ourselves to applications. They have to come up and say, we need your software. And then there's a marriage and we can go forward. Without that interaction, there's no, there's no uh, you, can't be, you can't be isolated developing software in, in a room. This is what we're trying to cover. This is uh, looking at um, uh, some of the LAPAC and ScalaPAC stuff to see what's there. Um, uh, uh, you know, we're improving on things, we're making new things. Um, uh, we don't need the level one laws. Uh, you know, there's improvements going on to the algorithms, trying to get state-of-the-art stuff here. Uh, we're delaying having the non-symmetric eigenvalue problem. That's because um, there wasn't a great need for it. There wasn't a calling by the applications for the non-symmetric eigenvalue, so we delayed that, right? So it's also a harder problem. So we felt that without the calling for it, we didn't have to rush into it. So that'll be done at some point, maybe in the, in the future, if there's a future. Okay, uh, just to give you a, a glimpse of what's happening here, LAPAC dealt with these panels in terms of the factorizations, things sort of are structured in terms of panels, trying to focus on level three blahs whenever, whenever possible. Uh, that was great in the LAPAC days, but this is ineffective on, on the machines we're talking about. What we're trying to do is break things up into tiles and use those batched blahs to gain performance on the GPUs. So we take those same algorithms and we express them differently. So these are the components, if you will, that are gonna be uh, used or called internally. That leads to a directed acyclic graph for the computation. If we execute the critical path in the graph, the longest path in the graph, it'll free up uh, the most uh, parallelism and we can, we can engage in a better level of parallelism than we can if we just had simple loops around things. So that's, that's sort of the structure of the package. And uh, you know the graphs get more complicated as you might guess. 
and it makes decisions on where to farm out components of that, whether you use the CPU as the, as the, as, as the engine that drives some of that or use the GPU uh, to actually do the computation. If you don't use the GPU, you're only gonna get 2% of the peak performance. So you've got to stretch and use the GPU whenever possible. Um, so all of these uh, algorithms and things, we can, you can formulate that way. We can, get, uh, we can get use of the batched operations in a very effective way. And the performance uh, has a good potential uh, for that. But you know, things like this, you should have in mind. So this is looking at the performance of Scalapack and the Slate library. So Slate library can use the GPUs, Scalapack doesn't. So Scalapack running on uh, the pre exascale system, which is the system at uh, the old system at, uh, uh, at Oak Ridge, uh, looks something like that. Uh, this is for a Cholesky decomposition. Again, uh, the old scale pack doesn't use GPUs. It's only a CPU driven. So you're only gonna get the benefit of the CPU. That's the 2%. And by using the GPUs, you can get much higher. You have to use the GPUs or you should not be using this machine. Okay, so you know, classical analysis may not be valid. I think I mentioned this already. Uh, processors are over provisioned for floating point. How am I doing this time? wise I've got another half hour. No, no. So five minutes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so data movement's extremely expensive. Operation counts not good. So we talked about that. So this this graph caught my eye. So this is running on uh, the machine uh, at uh, Oak Ridge Summit. That's the pre exascale machine. And what we're looking at here is Slate running. And um, what we're looking at is a performance. So we're looking at here the um, we're looking at the size of the matrix varying. We're looking at the execution rate and we're looking at uh, the performance. So LU with no pivoting does this. So turn off pivoting in the algorithm, this is what we get. If you leave pivoting on, you get this, uh, this line down here. So the pivoting is extremely expensive. So you've got to move data around. The data movement's critical for performance. If you don't move data, you get good performance. If you move data, you're going to die. So we don't want to die. Um, so we, we turn maybe communication avoiding LU is a, is a potential. So that's what communication avoiding does. Doesn't get you much, gets you some, but not much. The QR algorithms here in terms of the performance, I'm dividing everything by two thirds n cubed. So all these lines to reflect time, time effectively. So I've tried to be fair in terms of the analysis of these things. So that caught my eye and said, we got to do something different. What can we do to help uh, you know, a common problem get higher performance and still be stable? Uh, so if you run LU with no pivoting on most problems you're gonna fail. So here's what I call responsibly reckless. So the idea here is to try a fast algorithm that might be unstable, it might fail, but you can detect the failure and then roll back and do something that's less, um, less efficient. Uh, but you need to, uh, you, you need to do that uh, check in order to see if you're efficient. So the idea is to use an algorithm that's unstable, potentially unstable, run it, get an answer, check to see if you've got the right answer and then back up if you fail to use the old stuff it's a fail safe checkpoint. And then um, uh, if you're okay, you got a solution. So uh, uh, pivoting is expensive. What can we do to avoid that? There was this paper by Parker a number of years ago about uh, randomizing uh, the matrix, not randomization in the context that we talked about yesterday, but this is randomizing the elements in the matrix. So Parker's paper said, uh, we're gonna apply a transformation to the matrix. We're gonna scramble the matrix. Think of it that way. We're gonna smear the matrix up a bit smear it up with a transformation that's very low cost. So you, and the, the, uh, the idea is that smearing it will avoid the pivoting situation. So take a matrix. This is the matrix that we're gonna use to uh, do the smearing. It's a, it's a very simple operation, order n squared operations to apply it. And we may have to apply it recursively. Parker says, if you do this n times, this kind of recursion here n times with probability one, you don't pivot. So uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's something there. The question is how many times should we, do we have to apply it? I don't know the answer to that. We apply it as a few times and then hope for the best. And then we apply re iterative refinement to the solution to get it to see if we get it back. So here's that slide again, no pivoting. This is LU with pivoting. This is the butterfly transformations with the step of iterative refinement. So we're again, capturing a lot of the performance and there's a test to see if we've actually uh, got, the, uh, got the solution. So uh, let me just uh, conclude. This is, these are the guys doing the work. Uh, I don't do much anymore, I'm retired. Um, but I have to say, Nick's fingerprints are all over our software. You know, if I, if I look at Nick's papers, 
and look at uh, the contributions he's made and try to match that to the software we have in Slate in LAPAC and ScalaPAC for that matter, you know, we see many things that he's contributed to which has benefited or influenced our software over the past, the past few years. So thank you again, Nick, happy birthday. So I, I took uh, Nick's uh, uh, papers, and I think this is a referencing basically a hundred of his papers, took the titles of them, and that's the word cloud for that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs>